Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Amanda Sisselman Borgia and I'm the chair of the Student Research Advisory Board. I would like to congratulate all of the students who are participating in the Student Scholarship Showcase this week, both live and asynchronously. I am impressed with the number of students who came together to showcase and present the amazing work that they are doing despite the difficult times that we are in. I think this speaks to the resilience and incredible tenacity of our Lehman students. Thank you also to the faculty sponsors who support this great work. I have been participating in and viewing the asynchronous presentation since yesterday, and I invite you all to do the same over the course of the next couple of days. I'm impressed with the quality of the work, the diversity of topics, and the importance of all the work being presented. So I'm looking forward to today's presentations live. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the board members of the Student Research Advisory Board for their hard and tireless work in shifting this to an online format so quickly. Jennifer Van Allen, Robert Farrell, Eileen Markey, Yuri Gorakovich, Justine McGovern, Michael Sullivan, Tylesha Gonzalez, Michelle Augustine, Lisa Peralta, Brandon Beggarly, and Jonathan Rose. And without any, uh, we cannot forget Aurora Cayetano and Grace Miel, our research assistants who have been real troopers and worked very hard to make sure that all of our presentations were put up on Blackboard asynchronously and they have been extremely helpful in organizing all of this for all of us. So I want to thank all the board members and our trustee research assistants, Aurora and Grace. So with that, we'll get started. We will follow the schedule that you received via email for the order of presentations, and we'll give reminders if you're getting close to your time. We've asked all students to present uh, between five and 10 minutes. Um, so if you're getting close to that, we'll let you know. We'll allow for a short question and answer period after each presentation, and then we'll move forward. I will try to remind the next presenter via private chat that it's um, almost your chance that you can get ready to present. If you would like to share your screen, you can do that at the bottom using the green share screen button. I've set it up so that you, anyone who wants to do that during their presentation can do that. And I just want to remind everyone if they're not speaking to mute their microphone so that we can hear the presenter. Okay. So we will start off with Alexandra Bloshenko and Jasmine Robinson. I'm recording these, the next two presentations at the request of their faculty sponsor, and I will double check in with each participant before we, um, before we hear from them whether or not they would like us to record. So please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm fine with being recorded. Great. As am I. Great. Okay. Um, I can. Is there a way for us to pull up this presentation, like for you to show it on your screen? Uh, if you would like to send it to me, yes. Are you able to share your screen or no? You want to send it to me? Um. Actually, I can. I can probably just share my screen. That yeah, works. share your screen. Okay. Use the green button on the bottom. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. All righty. Um, so just before we get started, I'd like to say that we did our best to uh, condense this as much as possible because we did have a lot of information that we wanted to share. Um, the question that we investigated was uh, evaluating the health threat from cosmic radiation during a manned mission to Mars. Um, okay. So first and foremost, in order for this to be possible, we would have to utilize a Hoffman transfer. Um, a Hoffman transfer is a transfer orbit that requires the minimum amount of energy. Um, so this is uh, more feasible in terms of the amount of resources and the funding that would have to go into a manned mission. Um, and we also have to keep into keep in mind the specific times that would be necessary in order for this to be possible. Um, so what we first did is we calculated the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit by getting the average of Earth's and Mars' semi-major axis. And then we went ahead and we used uh, Kepler's third law in order to calculate the time it would take for a trip like this. So we found that it would be 518 days in total so 259 there and 259 back. 
Um, now, something to consider is that in order for this to happen successfully, you need to launch uh, our organization. Now, showing an example of an unsuitable timing of such a where you the space not really end up on the. Um, here we see an animation that shows when the city is present, so we are able to successfully land. So um, because that's a plan, and it's more important that for us to get back to Earth for more 460 days. So once we take this all into consideration, it uh, means that a manned trip to Mars utilizing the Hoffman transfer should take about two years in total. Jasmine. So um, we uh, used some data collection instruments in this investigation. Uh, the first one being the radiation detector. This was on board the Mars Scientific Laboratory. It collects valuable data on particle radiation inside the vessel during the travel from Earth to Mars. The next one is the Mars radiation experiment known as MARIE. This is on board the Mars Odyssey satellite, and this provides estimates of the absorbed radiation dose in the Mars orbit, which we think is going to be similar to what's actually on the planet. The next slide is a table of data collected from both of these, MARIE and um, RADAR on the bottom, and it shows the absorbed doses. So, cosmic rays environment on Mars. There are a couple of different types of radiation. The one that we are most concerned with is GCR, the galactic cosmic rays. And um, this is the one that damages DNA and it's difficult to shield from. The atmosphere on Mars provides some shielding, so staying low will reduce the amount of radiation that you incur on the planet. However, the Mars atmosphere, unlike Earth, is patchy, so not all areas are equally shielded. So this is a visual representation of the galactic cosmic rays that actually reach the surface of Mars. And you could see the difference where the green is less and the red is more. Next is um, a same visual, but this one is showing REMS per year and it ranges from 10 to 20 rems per year that the planet is actually receiving. So um, the units that we use, there are several units. Sievers is important. It's a biological unit that measures the effect on um, human tissue. The other two, grays and rad, are our physical units measuring the quantity of the radiation dose and one siever is equal to one gray, and that's also equal to 100 rad. So what's important on this slide is, again, the conversion, one cedar being 100 rem, and rem is the dosage of rads. So here we have, um, it's a range. So I took the lowest range and the highest range to figure out uh, how much we would be receiving about. And the lowest is about two, 0.273 millisievers per day. And on the high end, it's about 0.547 millisievers per day. And if you look at this, it falls in about the range that we thought it would. Okay. So uh, let's assume the best case scenario where we can have some control over our um, radiation uh, exposure on the planet. And let's just take the lowest number that um, we would be exposed to on the surface of Mars. So if we take, remember, uh, grays and sieverts is a one-to-one -one conversion. So if we take those milligrays and we convert them to uh, grays, uh, and then multiply by the amount of days on the planet, we end up getting 0 0.0966 grays in total, which is a one-to-one -one conversion to sieverts. Uh, this number we, we find actually ends up being negligible in terms of the overall radiation. If we take the lower end, so this value 1.75 millisieverts was actually also collected by the RAD uh, detector. 
Um, so if we take the lower end of the absorbed radiation in space, we do find that, and we multiply it by the number of days of interplanetary travel, we do find that this ends up being 0 0.9065 seabirds per day. So that is a significantly higher number. Now, if we take the maximum predicted absorbed radiation dose also reported by the same instrument, three millisieverts a day, we multiply by the amount of days in space that we would need, we actually get an even higher number. So it's 1.554 sieverts per day. Um, so that is really, really substantial. And what this tells us is that the biggest health threat will actually be specifically during the interplanetary travel. So going from Earth to Mars and then from Mars back. Um, so what we did in order to find the total for a Hoffman transfer trip, um, so we combined the total radiation from the time on Mars with the radiation that we get from the total time in space. This is our best case scenario, which would be just 1.0031 sieverts in total. Whereas um, our higher end that we are predicting would be about 1.6506 sieverts in total. So um, just to give you some more context on this, this is really significant. Um, and we do mm -hmm. find that our, our range that we have calculated actually really falls in line with the predicted radiation dose uh, provided by NASA. So this right here is in millisieverts, so that's 1.2 sieverts. Just a reminder, close to time. Okay, thank you. Oh, Jasmine, you're muted. So what does this all mean, right? Uh, what it means is that um, we have these listed health risks and these health risks are assuming that you have lower radiation. So our astronaut, these health risks will be amplified. Um, sex and the age of the astronaut play a role. By these numbers, you can, um, the most viable person to do a manned space mission would be a man 55 years old. The millisieverts that's received would be too high for anybody of a lower age. So something that's important to note is that these limits presented correspond to just a 3% increase in the risk of exposure-induced death over a, the course of a 10-year period. However, a Hoffman transfer would only take about three years. So um, assuming a linear scale, this would actually increase the percent risk up to 10%. So in order to really compensate for this, we must reduce the career exposure limits by 70% to accommodate for that. So again, just to reiterate, the only person who ends up qualifying for a trip like this would be uh, a male who is 55 years or older. And even then they are, you know, 1,200 um, is still a number that we are likely to surpass during this kind of trip. Jasmine. Yeah, so just real quickly, um, we're trying to figure out how are we going to lower our cosmic radiation um, exposure. You can build an underground shelter when we're on the uh, planet, but uh, we already experience a negligible amount. So really what our next step is to figure out how to lower or buffer the um, amount that we receive on the way to earth and the way back um potentially we could use waste products produced by the astronauts maybe water plastic and these will buffer some of these dangerous waves thank you thanks everyone Thank you both very much. Does anyone have any questions for Alexandra or Jasmine? Oh, we got a clap. <laughs> you got a Zoom clap. Thank you. That was really interesting. I'm learning new things by listening and participating in all of these um, presentations. Oh, more claps, more Zoom claps. Oh, lots more Zoom claps giving you a real clap. <laughs> Thank you okay. guys so much. We really, really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you so much for doing this. It was really great. And I found it really fascinating, all of this. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, so we are going to move to our next presenter, which is Claire McMahon.
and I'm going to continue recording as your faculty sponsor suggested it would be okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's totally fine. Great. Okay. I'm going to remind everybody else to mute their microphone while Claire is speaking. Would you like to share your screen? Yes, definitely. Go I'm ahead. Uh, trying to do that right now. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. This has been really, uh, really interesting so far. All right. So, let me get the full screen. Our paper uh, attempted to answer the question, are low luminosity gamma ray bursts the progenitors of ultra high energy cosmic rays correlating with starburst galaxies? And uh, so that, uh, that's me, Claire Meckman. Uh, I worked with uh, Professor Luis and Jorge, his grad student uh, here at Lehman. Now I know the, the title is pretty heavy, so I'm gonna break it down a little bit. Uh, so what is a starburst galaxy? A uh, starburst galaxy is a galaxy like this one, the Antenna Galaxy, in this image that I took from Wikipedia. Um, it's a galaxy where the star formation rates per unit area exceeds a, gr a large number. They're, they're experiencing a great deal of star formation. Mm. And uh, so this star formation and all of the activity within these starburst galaxies releases these enormous outflows of gas that we call starburst-driven superwinds. And this is what is occurring as older stars are dying and newer stars are forming. Uh, the activity and the gravity is inducing these enormous outflows of gas. Uh, so this gas uh, collides with each other uh, and it ends up creating these hot bubbles, extraordinarily hot, thousands of uh, Kelvin, of this metal-enriched plasma. And in this plasma, the particles are accelerating to ultra high energies. Uh, they're getting tossed around in there, colliding with each other and uh, getting up to these ultra high energy levels uh, along that shock front that's created by the plasma. And this uh, acceleration to ultra high rates releases ultra high energy cosmic rays. So gamma radiation and uh, gamma ray bursts specifically, uh, we divide them into categories based on their characteristics. Uh, so we have long gamma ray bursts and short gamma ray bursts. Short is uh, less than two seconds in length. Uh, and then we also have high luminosity uh, and the, I have the uh, luminosity there, uh, 10 to the 49 erg per second, and low luminosity, which is less than 10 to the 49 ergs per second. Uh, and then we're also dividing the gamma ray bursts uh, into categories based on their distance uh, nearby with a redshift less than 0 0.3 and intermediate redshift gamma ray bursts, uh, which are redshift less than or greater than 0 0.3, but less than one. Uh, there's no evidence that these populations are different. We're just dividing them based on distance because a low luminosity gamma ray bursts can't be detected at greater than redshift 0 0.3. The equipment just isn't sensitive enough. Uh, we haven't developed our technology to the point where we can detect these low level gamma ray bursts at greater distance. So here's a little graphic uh, from NASA that shows the uh, progenitors of gamma ray bursts on the left hand side. Uh, so we're talking about the, the lower section, which is a star going supernova and uh, releasing a great deal of gamma radiation. And you can see here, the, uh, this is the shock wave of plasma traveling out and releasing a gamma ray burst. So the difference between the long gamma ray bursts and short gamma ray bursts, um, the consensus among scientists right now is that long gamma ray bursts are a result of a core collapse supernova, which is a specific type of supernova. Uh, it's classified as type 1C, and it's called a stripped envelope supernova. Uh, that means that the envelope of hydrogen and helium that surrounds the core of the star is uh, stripped away by the extreme force of the explosion of the core collapse. 
And uh, when we look at the spectra of these stripped envelope supernova, we can see these very broad lines in their spectra, which means that something is ejecting out of there very, very quickly at extreme velocities. So we call this a type 1C dash BL for broad lines. Uh, these short gamma ray bursts most likely have a different origin. They're probably coming from a different type of supernova or a black hole, neutron star merger, something's going on that's creating these shorter gamma ray bursts. Uh, but because any gamma ray burst, long or short, are these outliers that arise in small galaxies, uh, we can't take a picture of the progenitor. We don't have the capability of capturing an image of what is causing this gamma ray burst. We can only extrapolate the properties of its progenitor from the environment that it comes from. So we track the gamma ray burst back to where it came from, and then we try and figure out what caused this gamma ray burst. How did it happen? Now, uh, the property that we wanted to talk about in studying these low luminosity gamma ray bursts was the galactic metallicity. And uh, just as a side note, in this I'm referring to everything below helium on the periodic table as a metal. <laughs> this is something that astronomers do. I hope there's no chemists here to get annoyed. But if it's heavier than helium, it's a metal. Um, and according to our current research, gamma ray burst formation efficiency is limited by high metallicity. Any nearby long gamma ray burst with a documented associated supernova, so a gamma ray burst, a long gamma ray burst that we were able to track directly back to its source, came from a faint metal poor galaxy. And uh, in comparison, a nearby type 1c BL supernova, the one that should be releasing a long gamma ray burst, that any of those that didn't have an associated gamma ray burst had a very significant fraction of high metallicity host galaxies. Uh, these carbon and oxygen rich stars in galaxies with high metallicity are very good candidates for being progenitors of gamma ray bursts, but their rotation velocity decreases at a high metallicity. So overall, the conclusion that uh, scientists have drawn is that the higher the metallicity, the fewer the gamma ray bursts. Now, the Pierre Auger Collaboration is a group of scientists, uh, uh, many of them Argentinian. Uh, they're studying high energy particle physics and cosmic rays. And uh, recently, as of when we uh, released the paper uh, back last semester, they had released a study which, re which reported a 4.5 sigma correlation between the arrival directions of these high energy cosmic rays and nearby ga starburst galaxies. So the origin of these cosmic rays was proposed to be low luminosity gamma ray bursts. And out, we aimed to show in our paper that the low luminosity gamma ray bursts from starburst galaxies ga could not be the source of these high energy cosmic rays. That was our uh, hypothesis. So it, by analyzing these low luminosity gamma ray bursts, we assumed that the low luminosity and the long gamma ray bursts have similar progenitors, uh, which makes sense based on the data that we've seen so far. Um, and again, the low luminosity is uh, defined according to the, uh, being less than 10 to the 49 erg per second. Uh, solar metallicity, the metallicity of our sun is uh, 8.69 just to, to give some context to the metallicity in the uh, fourth column here in this chart, uh, this table rather, and uh, nearby is redshift Z less than 0 0.3. So the, this table here shows the property of nearby low luminosity gamma ray bursts, uh, their progenitors, and the environment that they came from. And we can see that the highest uh, metallicity that we've uh, that we have on this table is 8.6, right around the metallicity of our sun. Just reminder, close to time. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, 
more definition of our sample, the uh, auger uh, and anisotropy search originally had a sample of 23 starburst galaxies with flux greater than 0 0.3 joule years out of 63 total objects observed. Uh, they updated it using a different source to 32 starburst galaxies, and we selected 10 of these galaxies that had had their average metallicities determined by analysis of their oxygen emission lines. Um, some of the galaxies in their sample have a double starburst a, uh, active galactic nuclei nature. Uh, no active galactic nucleus host galaxy has been found to host a gamma ray burst, just as a uh, interesting point of fact. So in our analysis, we adopted the Kolmogorov Smirnov or two sample test uh, to check if these two data sets of metal metallicity are drawn from the same underlying probability distribution uh, without assuming any specific model for that distribution. Our null hypothesis was that the sample functions should be equal for all X, which is a real number, and the empirical distribution fun function or EDF of the sample is the proportion of sample observations which do not exceed X, that real number. And D is the maximum absolute difference between the two functions over all values of X. Uh, so we have the statistical analysis right here in this figure uh, showing the vertical displacement between the sample distribution functions. And if D is greater than 0 0.55, then the null hypothesis is excluded at a 90% confidence level. And it, that's what ended up happening. Our null hypothesis was excluded with 90% confidence. So we used the metallicity of the host galaxies of these low luminosity gamma ray bursts to investigate whether they could be the source of high energy cosmic rays correlating with these nearby galaxies. And at a 90% confidence level, we were able to show that the auger association between low level luminosity gamma ray bursts and starburst galaxies does not match our observations. And that's it. Thank you so much. This was so interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. You're getting lots of Zoom claps. Yay. <laughs> That was awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm learning so much about all these different things, but it's so interesting. All of these <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad uh, you're enjoying this. I hope to I learn a lot more. I am. It's so cool. Okay. So our next, does anyone have any questions? You can either type them into the chat box for me and I'll read it, or you can quickly unmute yourself. I don't see any it was questions. that good? No questions. I think that's fine. So thank you again so much. Thank you for so having me. Work. You're welcome. Okay, our next speaker is Nabunu Diaby, and I hope I said that correctly. Yeah. Okay, great. Welcome. And how do you feel about having your presentation recorded? If you would rather not, I can stop the recording or I can leave it recording. Uh, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to let you go ahead and I'll give you a reminder when you get close. Okay. Do you know how to share your screen? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I feel like, what are my purposes? Did you pick the right part of your screen? Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see it? If you, we, we don't, I don't know if we're seeing what you um, want us to see. When you share your screen, you have to choose the presentation. I see your Zoom screen. Uh -oh. So maybe stop sharing and reshare. And when you share again, choose mm -hmm. the part of your screen that you want to share. You click on it. There you go. Perfect. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Nabunu Diaby, and today I will be talking to you about my project, which is the relationship between acculturation and attachment. 
So one of the elements of this project is attachment theory. Attachment theory explains a bond between a child and their primary caregiver. It's mainly the support and responsiveness from the caregiver that determines a child's level of security. So for example, a highly responsive caregiver and consistent caregiver is associated with a securely attached child, while on the other hand, an inconsistent caregiver who is sometimes unresponsive can lead to a child that is anxiously attached. So researchers argue that through interacting with our primary caregivers, we develop schemas about ourselves and others, which we use later on in life when we're trying to form other bonds such as friendships and romantic relationships. So the same patterns of attachment we see in children can also be seen in dating, um, dating partners. So for example, people who are securely attached tend to have relationships that is characterized, that are characterized by happiness and trust, whereas anxious individuals tend to be preoccupied with um, rejection in their relationships, and avoidant individuals will be will try to like avoid deep intimacies with their partner. Um, so while we know that parenting plays an important role in attachment, um, culture also plays a role, specifically the dimension of individualism and collectivism. So individualistic cultures such as USA or England are characterized by the value they place on the self and achieving personal goals. Um, on the other hand, collectivistic cultures such as China and India value dependency on others and social harmony. Research shows that people from collectivistic cultures tend to be higher in attachment anxiety and avoidance. <clears throat> so, Sorry. So research shows that people in collectivistic cultures tend to be higher in attachment anxiety and avoidance, while people from individualistic cultures tend to be higher in secure attachment. So for example, so the reason why people think that collectivistic cultures may be higher in attachment anxiety is that they place a lot of pressure on social relationships and constantly relying on others to validate yourself can lead to heightened anxiety. On the other hand, Oh, an explanation as to why um, avoidance attachment is higher in collective risk cultures that they place lots of value on social harmony. And so people tend to hide their emotions so to not break that social harmony, so, which can lead to further distancing yourself from others. <clears throat> Another element of this project is acculturation. Acculturation is a process by which changes take place in an individual's mindset and personality due to the interaction between two cultures. So for example, a person moving from one country to another country. So research shows that the longer an individual stays in a new society, the more they become like the inhabitants of that society. So for example, a study done on Japanese immigrants found that the longer they stayed in America, the more their personality became like their European American counterparts. And the same can be said with def mm, different generational statuses. So for example, a study done on Hispanic adolescents found that their generation Hispanic adolescents associated more with American culture compared to their second and first generation peers. So with this information in mind, we thought the same might be found for um, attachment. So the first goal of this study was to replicate what, replicate what previous research has found, which is that attachment, anxiety, and avoidance is higher in collectivistic cultures. Uh, we also hypothesize that the longer an individual has lived in America, the more acculturated they feel, and the more likely it is that their attachment will be altered to match what is common in the U.S., which is a secure attachment. So to evaluate this, we had 93 participants um, who were mainly female. The generational status consisted of about 45% first generation or immigrant, and about 55% were um, second generation or later generation. And we had a diverse group of race. <clears throat> so participants completed an online survey in the Lehman Relationships Lab. Uh, one of the measures that the participants completed is their experience in close relationships. So this um, measure is a widely used measure. So, sorry guys. Uh, it's a widely used 12-item self-report measure, uh, which assesses attachment, anxiety, and avoidance in relationships. So if a person were to score low on both of these measures, then they would be considered secure. Um, participants also reported their country of origin. So with this, we use a Hofsey Insights tool 
to um, measure the degree in the, of individualism for these countries. So in this to higher scores indicate higher individualism. So for example, United States has a score of 91, whereas lower scores indicate um, more collectivism. So for example, a country like Pakistan had a score of 14. And for all participants, they completed the following question, which was how much would you say you feel a part of the American culture? So this is um, the replication part of our hypothesis. So here the highlighted cells are what are more important to the study. So above the diagonal, above the diagonal are the Pearson correlation and below the diagonal are the Spearman correlation. So Spearman correlation is an analysis that is strong against the assumption of normality. And we had to use this because our individualism scores were not normally distributed. So as we can see here, um, there was no significant difference in attachment anxiety or avoidance between um, non-immigrants and immigrants. But however, as predicted, country of origin level of individualism was associated with anxiety. So the more individualistic their country of origin was, the less um, anxious they were. But we did not find the same thing for avoidance attachment. This is the second part of our hypothesis. Um, so as we can see here, attachment was not related to um, participants' generational status, nor was it related to years living in the US, which we did just for immigrants, even when we control for a country of origin level of individualism. But however, across all participants perceived fit into the American culture was associated with attachment avoidance. So the more they felt like they fit into the American culture, the less avoidant they were. Just a reminder, you're close to time. Okay. Um, so given the, the relationship between attachment and feelings of American culture fit, we looked at the interaction between perceived fit with American culture and attachment and if it differed for immigrants or non-immigrants. So as we can see here, um, Contrary to our prediction, this um, effect was driven by non-immigrants rather than immigrants. So the more non-immigrants felt like they didn't fit, so the more they felt like they didn't fit in the American culture, the higher their uh, avoidant attachment was. So we found that culture was associated with attachment and romantic relationships. So more specifically, people from individualistic cultures tended to be lower in attachment anxiety, but we did not find this in for attachment avoidance. We believe this might have to do with our sample. Um, a lot of the times when researchers use um, collectivistic cultures, they tend to use East Asian um, samples such as China or, yeah, such as China. But in our sample, we have um, people from uh, um, countries from like Africa or like the Caribbean or Southeast Asia. So we believe that um, these cultures might differ in other ways than just collectivism. Um, a culturation, culturation was largely unrelated to their romantic attachment. So we didn't find an effect for generational status or years live in the US. Uh, but we did find that uh, participants who felt like they did not fit in the in the American culture were higher in attachment avoidance, and this was more so for non-immigrants. Um, one of the limitations of our study was that individualism scores were not normally distributed. Uh, also, we believe that for future, in the future, it might be useful to do longitudinal studies. So when immigrants first come, take an assessment of their attachment and see how that um, changes over time the longer they stay in the new society. It may also be useful to know about how much the newcomers interact with the new people in the society, with the people already in the society, because I think we can all agree, usually when people come from other countries, they t tend to find societies in which they fit in and they don't like branch out to other places. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to say a big thank you to my research advisor, Professor Anna Larson, and also to the uh, assistant lab workers, uh, Anahi Vasquez and Rubina Becca. Thank you guys. That was wonderful. Thank you. That's so interesting. Oh, you're getting your Zoom claps. <laughs> this is great and really important information that we can use to help people. When we know all these things, we can do more to help. Does anybody have any questions? I see lots of Zoom claps. <laughs>
you can either leave me a question in the chat or you can unmute yourself and speak. I don't hear any questions. Thank you so much again. Really wonderful work. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Our next presenter is Jimmy Sanchez. Jimmy, are you ready? You guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. How do you, would you like to be recorded or would you like me to stop the recording? Um, I think it's not okay to record, but as for me, it'd be fine, but I don't know about my, my PI, so. Okay, I will stop the recording just in case. How about that? All right. I, hello, I'm his PI. He's, everything is okay. He can set it. He can be oh, Okay, it. okay. We'll leave it All on. Right. Okay. Thank All you. Right. So it's fine. <laughs> okay. So we are ready to hear from you, and I will um, remind you when you're getting close to time, okay? All right. So let me just pull up the presentation. You guys can see it fine, right? Yes, we can see it. All right. So my name is Jimmy, and I titled my presentation, Why Worry About New Treatments for Cerebral Malaria? And that's essentially because there are none for this complication of malaria. And just for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be referring to it as CM. Okay, so just a little background on, the, on malaria. It's one of the most prevalent tropical diseases affecting humans. It's caused by, well, the ones that affect humans are of the Plasmodium genus. There's five species, but only one causes cerebral malaria, and that's Plasmodium falciparum. And it's spread by mosquitoes of the Anopheles genus. So symptoms of malaria include flu-like symptoms, fevers, malaise, sweating, and a big sign of it would be all of that plus chills. So annually there are 200 million cases and 400,000 deaths and that's a big reduction compared to how it was 10 years ago and this is big because most of those deaths are of children under five years old so you can imagine that's a big loss okay so cerebral malaria the symptoms for that since it's a late stage complication you'll see seizures, comas, and neurological abnormalities. And even if you come out of the coma, you'll come out with uh, cognitive deficits and impairments. So you can imagine the morbidity rate for coming out of the coma is really high. So, okay, I'll move on to the objective of our experiment. Our experiment wanted to test the use of adjunctive th therapies to see how it would affect um cm cases so we separated it into four groups a control and three treatment groups and we measured the parasitemia levels the survival rates and the number and size of brain hemorrhages so this is essentially our model we had <clears throat> we had our mice experimental model infected by plasmodium bergei anca it was infected intraper intraperitoneally and so it was infected in day zero blood was taken according to this diagram day three five seven and so on but treatment did not start until between day five and seven when they developed signs that they had developed cm and that's because we wanted to simulate what a real case was like so uh a person with cm would come in let's say in a coma Someone would bring them in, and then they'd be treated right away with uh, anti-malarial. And so you can imagine that without any treatment specifically for CM, the best you're getting is what you get for an uncomplicated case. So here we investigated um, the difference between being treated with chloroquine, an anti-malarial drug, being treated with chloroquine and a cholesterol drug, adervacetin. Uh, the next treatment was chloroquine and erbisartan, 
a hypertension drug. And then the last treatment was a mixture of all three of those medications. So, and this is basically how we divided our groups. Those between eight and 10 members in each group. These were the doses they were given and the administration they were given. So you can see here, administration was either by IP, which was an inserted peritoneal or oral gavage. And these are labels I'll be using for the data that we collected, CL, ATR, IRB, and mix. So these were the first results we recorded and graphed, which was the paracetamia by day. So as you can see that the peak was around day five, which was when symptoms of CM showed up. And after that, after the application of the treatment, you can see that trends started to go down, which usually at first eyesight, it's a good sign. And next was a survival curve to see how the mice dealt with being treated and how CM proved against the treatment. So right here, the red line was the, the control group with only being treated by chloroquine. And as you can see, more than 50% of the mice had died after less than 50, 50 hours. So less than two days, more than 50% died. And if you look above, you see the three other treatment groups and none of the groups lost 50% of the group samples. So that's another positive sign. Oh, and on top of that, there were significant values compared to our control group. So it's a big difference being treated with adjunctive therapies compared to just the anti-malarial drug. And so we took three parts of the brain, the parenchyma, the olfactory bulbs, and the cerebellum. The, this data right here is involving the parenchyma. And if you look at the distribution and the significance among the differences in the means, you can see that there was a big difference between the control group, the ATR group, the, the control group, and the mixed group. And reducing the number of hemorrhages. And then when we look at the length of the hemorrhages, you see the same trend. And if we move on to the olfactory bulbs, which is where you'll find most of the hemorrhages, you see sort of the same trend, but it's not with the, the difference isn't with the same groups. Here, the difference was between the control group and ATR the, and control group and IRB. And it followed the same trend in, the, in reducing the length of hemorrhages as it did the number of hemorrhages. And the last part of the brain that we looked at was uh, cerebellum. Here, all the differences were significant it, between the control group, ATR, the control group, and IRB, and the, con the control group and mix, and reducing the number of hemorrhages and the length of the hemorrhages, which, again, it looks like positive signs. And when we measured the total throughout the entire brain, we had significant results in all of them again. So you can imagine it's looking good. Just a reminder and, that you're almost at time. All right, thank you. So these are images taken from the parenchyma. And if you look at the group treated with solely chloroquine at the top left, you can actually see the hemorrhages right here near the middle. You see two, and then on the top right, you see another one. But if you look at the other images, you don't really see them as obviously another good sign. And if you move on to the olfactory bulbs, you see way more hemorrhages and they're huge. So again, you look at the chloroquine group, you see them all around the tissue. Now, if you look at the other groups, you don't see them as much. That's another good result, especially in an actual patient. This is a cerebellum. Again, the chloroquine group, you see, you see them all over the place. Right here, that's a huge one. Here, you see two and another one on the top right. And this is just a magnified image of a hemorrhage of the control group. 
not a nice looking thing. And the conclusions we drew was, well, I'm just reiterating here. The results look very positive, especially with the survival rates. The adjunctive therapy groups lost less than 50% of the members. Um, the means and all the box plots displayed, again, big difference. They were lower compared to the control group, another positive sign. And the conclusion is that adjunctive therapies appear to lead to better results than being treated with solely an anti-malarial drug. And that's it. Thank you. That's super interesting. It's really very interesting to hear how these different um, treatments work and the findings that you had. Each and every one of you has been so articulate in describing your findings and the research that you're doing. I'm really proud and impressed. And I see you have lots of Zoom claps. <laughs> Thank you. You did an excellent job. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? Again, you can put them in the chat. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any other um, viable treatments aside from chloroquine, because although it is like the generic anti-malarial drug that is typically used, I know that at least in people, um, many people are not able to tolerate the side effects. Mm. Yeah, it does have heavy side effects. The current treatments for malaria include uh, artemisinin combination treatments. And that's pretty much it. Most, most of the times they, they look at ways to prevent getting malaria. So, you know, like mosquito nets and, you know, um, bug repellents, but that's pretty much it. Otherwise, yeah. it's the anti-malaria drugs that are available. Got it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. Okay. So if we have no other questions, we will move on to Louis Vega. Louis, are you ready? Yes. Let me uh, go ahead and share that. Okay. And I will give you a quick reminder when we get close to time. Okay. Okay. No problem. <laughs> uh, are you all able to see? Great. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Vega. I'm a master's student uh, in the biology department here at Lehman. Uh, my research mentor was Jack Henning, and uh, we worked on uh, identifying some water lilies over at Van Cortlandt Park. Uh, before I go into this, though, I just wanted to say I've been so impressed by all of the presentations, the PowerPoint presentations uh, before this point. Uh, since it's my privilege to be the first to present the poster, uh, I hope I'm up to par uh, with everything else that everyone's done. Um, Absolutely, so, and I agree. <laughs> <laughs> please bear with me. To begin with, and I hope this is zooming in properly, our uh, water lilies are up north of Lehman at Van Cortlandt Park. So Van Cortlandt Park, if you didn't know, big park, lots of biodiversity, uh, it's, it's in the middle of a succession uh, from when it was used for farming uh, and is now, being, uh, is now being taken over by some of the native flora again. And so uh, a lot of barcoding projects are done there. Uh, barcoding, by the way, uh, is in reference to a number of DNA markers that are used, like fingerprints, as, as written in my title. Uh, and these fingerprints, uh, which act very much like, almost like crime scene investigation, help to identify uh, various species from one another. Now a recent project that used this method found that the water lilies in Van Cortlandt Park were the European or exotic Nymphaea alba, the white water lily. This is somewhat uh, controversial because uh, the white water lily is not naturalized in North America outside of British Columbia all the way on the other side of the coasts. So uh, it would be a really big deal if it was found in nature. Uh, and it, in it was postulated that this was the case as opposed to the native uh, Nymphaea odorata. The two lilies have similar appearances in that they have these beautiful white flowers. Uh, the difference uh, uh, morphologically between them tends to be uh, the, the sweet smell in the N. odorata. Uh, but this can be hard sometimes to make out, especially when you're in a lake, uh, like here in an urban setting. And so uh, DNA barcoding was attempted to use to identify it among other species. 
We questioned whether this was the case, however, uh, because again, it would be very fairly controversial if it was naturalized here. And so what we did uh, was we redid the experiments from that barcoding project uh, by using an additional marker, an additional fingerprint, not just the one that they used, uh, in order to get clearer results. And uh, the reason for this, of course, is if the water lily in Van Cortlandt Park is indeed the native water lily, it could be accidentally removed by New York City's Department of Parks and Recreation that is constantly removing exotic flora from the location. We collected 14 samples of water lilies around the lake, uh, if you can see down here, let me try to make that clearer, uh, of which five were of sufficient quality to be able to use uh, for sequencing. And so we sequenced it uh, for two particular markers. The chloroplast gene RBCL and the uh, nuclear intergenic, uh, excuse me, the nuclear spacer ITS. And we took uh, samples from NCBI for N odorata uh, and ALBA uh, and its hybrid, potential hybrid, to just in case that, that was uh, part of the confusion here in the lake and align them along with NUFAR, the uh, closest related species to Nymphaea as a root. Uh, and our alignment revealed a number of single nucleotide mutations uh, throughout the two different markers, the majority of which were in ITS uh, as opposed to RBCL. And we'll talk about that in a moment. When we ran the alignment through uh, maximum likelihood analysis and created a tree, we actually found that our samples here in the black box, uh, N3, 4, N2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, nested within uh, Nymphaea odorata, the native plant, not Nymphaea alba, the exotic plant, as was originally proposed, or even the hybrid. And we found this with some fairly high level of confidence, uh, with uh, 88 bootstrap support suggesting that uh, our water lilies and N. odorata form a single clad, and 100 bootstrap support uh, suggesting that they are sister to a clad formed of N. alba and its hybrid. Uh, this was done with a bootstrap count of a thousand. So what did this mean? Well, for starters, our, re our alignment results uh, confirmed what has uh, been observed before between RBCL versus ITS in barcoding, which is that RBCL tends to be fairly conserved and therefore makes it more difficult to use to identify between species. It's great for genus or higher, maybe even uh, better for family, but within species, uh, it can be difficult to work with. Whereas ITS, being non-coding as a spacer, is much more variable and shows and, and resulted as such in our own studies. And so, due to the, our phylogenetic studies, we rejected the hypothesis that the water lilies are uh, N. alba, the exotic plant, or, or the hybrid. Uh, we confirmed that N. alba is most likely uh, the native N. odorata, and uh, with some moderate support. And we also highlight the importance of choosing variable barcodes when you do phylogenetic assessments. Uh, this helps to alleviate concern over potential exotic invasion in the, in the lake at Van Cortlandt Park and reconfirms how uh, essential barcoding can be when it comes to making diversity assessments and managing ecosystems. Quick uh, rundown of our conclusions. Van Cortlandt Park, uh, water lily is definitely an odorata. Uh, Single conserved markers can result in spurious phylogenetic outcomes, as was the case in the original project. And when accurate, barcoding can be a very useful tool for conservation. Our future directions, we intend to do the same analysis with uh, Bayesian, not just maximum likelihood, to see how a different statistical approach resolves the water lilies, just to confirm our results. And we'll be looking into uh, Typha, uh, the cattails in the lake which also may have native and non-native species there and are worth exploring. Uh, here are our references. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank the, uh, the Lehman College Department of Biology. Their, their research fellowship uh, was a big support in the course of this project. Uh, and so this, this is the result of their uh, continued support, both financially and uh, institutionally. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was great. It's so interesting to know more about the plants and the species that we have in the Bronx. It's important work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And I see lots of Zoom claps. I'm giving you a real clap. <laughs> awesome work. 
Does anybody have any questions? More Zoom claps. Beautiful, you did an excellent job. Your poster is beautiful, I love it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Vladislav Bodner. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you for asking. What about you? Good, are you ready to share your screen? Yes. All right, we're looking forward, thank you. Oh, before I forget, is it okay for me to video record you? Uh, yeah, there's no problem with that. Okay. I will leave it on. Can you see my screen? I can. All right. Oh. Hello, everyone. My name is Vladislav Bodner, and I am chemistry major in my last semester. I've been working in Professor Burton Pye's laboratory on lanthanide substituted Chrysler polyoxymethylate. So today I would like to generally discuss uh, this project and give some information on our latest findings. So polyoxymethylates are versatile nano-sized aggregates that are made out of um, early transitional metal oxoanions and additional heteroatoms. If you look on the structure on the right side of your screen, the blue polyhedra represent the early transitional metal oxoanions, and the yellow one represent phosphorus. Uh, they are all linked through ox uh, shared oxygen atoms, and polyoxymethylates are generally oxygen and electron-rich compounds. They are excellent hard inorganic ligands uh, that ligate well with uh, oxophilic transitional metals and F-block elements. So what is Preissler polyoxymethylate? Uh, methylate? Uh, it is composed of 5 PW6 oxygen 22 units uh, that are circularly arran arranged around central sodium ion uh, to form this donut shape uh, structure uh, with a central cylindrical cavity occupied by uh, sodium ion. Um, it has generally a five-fold symmetry uh, axis passing through the central cavity. And uh, the sodium ion is actually ligated on oxygen atoms closer to one of the ends of the cylindrical cavity. Uh, what's interesting about Preissler palm is that under high hydrothermal condition, the central sodium ion can be exchange for other oxophilic uh, atoms and depending on nature of element it will take a position somewhere within the cavity either closer to the edge or further uh, closer to the center and it can form up to tenfold coordination also it co can co coordinate water molecule uh, which makes it ph sensitive What's interesting uh, about Chrysler Palm as well is that both uh, Chrysler Palm and the exchange metal within the frameworks of Palm is electrochemically active. This allows us to use uh, such technique as cyclic voltimetry to study uh, their electrochemical properties. And what we've been focusing is uh, on previously reported work by Mark Antonio. Uh, who reported that that there's a reduction of trivalent europium within the frameworks of Preissler Palm. So the findings of this group are very interesting and let's look at the cyclic voltimetry data they have reported and there's two, uh, there's three uh, curves, uh, cyclic voltimograms on the left side of your screen. So the red and green one are both uh, look similar. And then when you look at blue one, it's the European substituted lanth uh, 
Chrysler polyoxymethylate. It has this distinct, uh, has this interesting peak that is make, making the general uh, cyclical thermogram different. It's at 400 millivolts. Uh, this we believe suggests that there's, uh, this, we believe that there's, this peak represents the reduction of trivalent europium to divalent europium. Uh, what's more interesting is the, their findings on Xanax analysis. Uh, if you look on the right side, uh, there's an emerging peak to the left as the potential in increases. Uh, so what's interesting here is that we supply electrons generally to the frameworks of Preissler poly um, oxymetallate, right? And this data suggests that there's some sort of communication between Preissler palm and the central encapsulated cent uh, central uh, lanthanide, uh, which allows the transition of electrons and further uh, reduction of this compound, uh, this element. Uh, so what Professor Burton Pye have proposed is that, uh, as we mentioned before, polyoxymetylates are very versatile and you can tune a lot of their properties, including solubility in different media. So we, we propose to synthesize uh, non-aqueous uh, lanth lanthanide substituted Preissler, in other words, uh, a Preissler polyoxymethylate that is soluble in organic media or organic solvent. And this would allow us to use a different uh, supporting electrolyte uh, to, to perform electrochemical studies. Uh, why this is important? This is important because it, by changing the supporting electrolyte, we can increase the potential window and potentially see a reduction of other lanthanide, uh, lanthanides that can be uh, incorporated within the structure of uh, Preissler polyoxymethylate. So this is some of the latest findings we, we were able uh, to achieve. Uh, if you look at the upper uh, cyclical thermogram, uh, you can see a parent sodium Preissler and it has two reversible peaks. But then if, when you look at the neodymium and europium one, they look much different and has, have many more uh, redu uh, reduction peaks. Uh, therefore, this suggests that there's a difference in electrochemical properties of lanthanide substituted Preissler palm. And if you look at the cerium one, this is how a cyclical Ultimogram looks uh, when no exchange have occurred. Apparently, we didn't observe exchange of uh, sodium with uh, trivalent cerium. Uh, also, we were able to synthesize uh, non aqueous salts of both neodymium and europium uh, polyoxymetylates and. As you can see here, <laughs> they both are different. Uh, they both differ from a non aqueous one. The potential window is much greater and reaches beyond uh, 1.3 volts uh, compared to 800, uh, 700 millivolts when in aqueous uh, electrolyte. And what's interesting is look, comparing those two cyclical thermograms because if we compare non-aqueous we see a difference between two cyclical thermograms. Uh, however, when we observe overlaid uh, cyclical thermograms of uh, parent uh, sodium Preissler polyoxymethylate and the two uh, non-aqueous uh, europium and neodymium Preisslers, there's actually no change between uh, TBA europium, which is organic uh, soluble uh, europium substituted Preissler palm and uh, the neodymium organic soluble uh, Preissler, uh, Preissler polyoxymethylate. So this is 
quite interesting because we didn't expect this outcome. We were hoping to see that other peak. Uh, therefore, we propose to perform a differential pulse voltimetry in our future work uh, to closer observe uh, potential peaks. Uh, so for the future work, uh, we want to synthesize a wider range of um, lanthanide substituted Freisler palm, palms and perform differential pulse voltimetry. Uh, also, recently we've been, well, we've been working on trying to make those uh, lanthanide substituted Freisler palms. And we, we observed this uh, interesting com complication is that when we use one of the improved yield uh, methods of production of parent sodium Preissler polyoxide metalate reported by uh, Michael Pope, uh, we, we can get a exchange to Acure. And we assume this has to do with the formation of disodium Preissler uh, heteropolytungstate. Uh, meaning that there's two sodium ions that get incorporated within the uh, within the cavity of the Preissler palm, and what's why we suggest that is because when compared to previously or recently uh, released uh, work on uh, preparation of potass dipotassium Preissler, uh, the changes in uh, or shifts in uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectra and uh, in cyclic voltimetry is very minor and we could potentially just not notice it. Uh, the best way to actually find uh, find out if the, ex the double exchange have occurred or incorporation of two uh, sodium ions have occurred is to perform single crystal x-ray diffraction analysis. Uh, maybe FTIR will be helpful since uh, by incorporating two metal ions, we achieve a uh, higher symmetry, which supposedly should make peaks uh, sharper and more and more well defined. Also, an elemental analysis can be performed to uh, determine the presence of two sodium atoms uh, within the frameworks of Preissler palm uh, stoichiometrically. Just a quick reminder that you're just about close to time. All right, so I would like to thank my PI, Professor Benjamin Burton Pye and his research group. Uh, they always very helpful and they, it's just amazing working with this group. Uh, if there's any chemistry students that are interested in organic chemistry, please contact Professor Burton Pye, he's great. <laughs> also, I would like to thank Professor Derry for allowing me to use her lab uh, work a lab space for performing cyclic ultima ultimetry and also Professor uh, Donna McGregor and her graduate, uh, graduate students for also sharing their lab space and always giving me helpful advices. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this. Excellent, really great work. You're getting lots of claps and Zoom claps. Thank you, really interesting that you took what you learned and made some good suggestions for future work. That's always important to have a plan going forward. Very nice, thank you so much. Does anybody have questions? I see more thumbs up. Uh, hello, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay, um, those results that you were showing with the lanthanides, um, combined with the polyoxymethylase. Uh, I see that the cyclic voltammetry, the, the graph was bigger. Does that mean that the reduction happen, happens for longer? Well, uh, we, what we were able to achieve is extend the... Uh, so yeah, first of all, we do see a, a shift in peak in a reduction. Let me actually share my screen again. I'll show it. Uh, we do see a reduction as shifts right here uh, when we make uh, organic soluble Preissler palm, but also we are able to uh, increase the potential window, the scan window. So we generally just can reach further uh, to the negative potential. Oh, okay. 
All right, I understand now. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't share it. So yeah, you can actually observe it here. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay, if we don't have any questions, thank you again. That was excellent work. More claps. And our next presenter is Lamisha Shaw. Lamisha, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'll give you a quick reminder when we get close to time, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, can everyone see my screen? We can. Okay, great. And I checked with Lamisha and she is okay with recording, so I'm going to continue. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Lamisha. Um, I'm a biology master's student here at Lehman. This is my first poster presentation, and today I'll be presenting on. Oops, today I'll be presenting on um, the mortal HeLa cell origin and cellular observation. First, I'll start with why HeLa cells are so important. HeLa cells have been used around the world in scientific research and became the most used cell line in biomedical research. HeLa cells' presence have made a large contribution to the scientific community and the advancement of science and medicine. They have been used to understand infectious agents, develop modern vaccines, and more. So here, the first column of the poster under HeLa cell contributions is a visual tool I created to envision a timeline of some of the many impacts HeLa cells have made. So after HeLa cells were discovered in 1951, in 1952, HeLa cells were experimented on by infecting them with everything from mumps, measles, herpes, and which led to the modern field of virology to grow. In that same year, researchers discovered that HeLa cells were susceptible to polio, which supported studies that eventually led to the creation of the polio vaccine. And then after that in 1954, stu scientists studied HeLa cells to develop a technique to isolate a single cell and keep it alive long enough for it to replicate and create a perfect copy of itself. This led to the field of animal cloning, gene therapy, and in vitro fertilization. Then in 1973, scientists used HeLa cells to understand the invasive and infectious nature of Salmonella, which is a bacterium that infects and causes food poisoning in humans. After that, in 1984, a virologist used HeLa to help prove the HPV human papillomavirus can cause cancer. And in 1993, researchers infected HeLa cells with tuberculosis DNA to learn about how tuberculosis attacks human cells. So clearly there's been a lot of contributions made to the scientific community by HeLa and even more than the few that I named. So let's understand where HeLa cells come from. HeLa cells are the unique cervical cancer cells from a woman named Henrietta Lacks. In 1951, Henrietta Lacks noticed that she was spotting between her menstrual cycles and she was experiencing lower abdominal pain. So she went to visit John Hopkins gynecology clinic and at the clinic she was given a cervical exam. Her cervical tissue was observed and it was noticed that there were large purple lesions found in her cervix. She was then diagnosed with cervical cancer, but unfortunately she died the same year as she was diagnosed. Her cervical cancer cells were taken without her consent or consent from her family, which is a major bioethical issue as she was not given credit for many years of research with the use of her cells. 
The cells were brought to John Hopkins Tissue Culture Lab and scientists were fascinated by her cervical cancer cells. They compared Hila, Hen, Henrietta Lacks cervical cancer cells to other cancer cell lines and realized that her cells would continuously divide, which led to the discovery of it being known as the first, first known immortal cancer cell line. And the cells were named Hila after Henrietta Lacks using the first two letters of her first and last name. And so with that, I performed a cell observation experiment of Hila cells in Lehman's molecular biology lab. I made um, qualitative observations of Hila cells to notice their unique and distinct cell shape by comparing them to another cell line. I compared them to MCF7 breast cancer cells to notice any visual differences between the cell lines. And I used a microscope at 10X objective to view both the HeLa cell sample and the MCF7 breast cancer cells. So here in the second column under cellular observation are pictures I took of both of the cell lines. In the top figure, figure B, are HeLa cell samples and the left image is a view from the microscope and the right image is a more focused and cropped view of the same image. And as you can see with the HeLa, they have a unique stretched out and distorted shape. In the bottom figure, figure C, the, are the MCF7 breast cancer cells. And when comparing the visual appearance of both the cell lines, you can see that the breast cancer cells have a more rounded out caucus shape um, when comparing to the HeLa. And in this particular example, the HeLa cells had a lower confluency and the MCF7 cells had a higher confluency. The HeLa cells that were used in this experiment are the same HeLa cells from Henrietta Lacks. And this is due to HeLa cells immortal nature as it continues to divide itself. And I'd like to show acknowledgement and appreciation to my molecular biology lab instructor, Justina Kastari, and Dr. Moira Swani, Henrietta Lux, and the Lehman College Biological Science Department. And yeah, thank you everyone for listening to my presentation. <laughs> Wow, that was great. So interesting. I found the history of the cells really interesting and the information about the, the woman um, that you spoke about. I found all of that really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that part of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone have any questions? You're getting lots of Zoom claps. I'm giving you a real clap. <laughs> If you have questions, you could type into the chat box or you could unmute yourself and ask a question. More Zoom claps. Mm -hmm. Great job. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Take care. Okay. So our next presenter is Victoria Smith. Victoria, are you ready? Yes, I am. Let me just start the video. Hi, can you guys see me? Hi, are you okay with being recorded? Yes, please do. Okay, we are going to carry forward. Thank you so much. Let me do a screen share, right? Yep. Okay, let me do present and let me get this screen share all situated. I'm using my mom's laptop, so I'm trying to figure out how to navigate it really quickly. That's okay. You guys are all doing an amazing job seamlessly presenting these things. Uh, Google Chrome unknown, I'm assuming, or is it desktop one? You can see, you should be able to see where, which one it's on. If it's on a browser and you use Chrome, that's probably it. Okay, it says Chrome unknown, allow open system preferences. Um, hey mom, it's not allowing me to screen share. Let me just do Zoom us to not be able to until I, what happened? Hold on, let me also see if maybe I can pull it up on my own laptop just in case. Sure. 
I've had some technical difficulties this morning, That's including my laptop shutting down. So uh -oh. but let's see. Let's see if I can do it on mine. Okay, we're not terribly behind, so we haven't. That's great. Late. What's the meeting ID number? Just so I can log in on my own computer. The meeting ID number is. Let me get that for you. You got it on your phone, Jordan. It's nine four four five three zero oh, seven. Can you find it. Six six one, I believe. Let me see. Oh six one six five five. Okay, it's yes, I should be in now. So let me just do it on my laptop. Okay, I'm moving to you. The only catch is that um, even if you won't be able to see it on the television, it's okay. Okay, okay so I'm going to mute your other one, okay? And now okay. I'm unmuting this one. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, great. And let me screen share right here. Um, it is presenting, it is loading slowly but surely. Okay. All right, now let me get into screen sharing. Okay. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. We are. You guys are seeing the screen? I can't hear you guys now. Can you guys we are. hear me? Yep, we're seeing it. Okay. Ah. Um. Okay, you guys can hear me? Thumbs up, I can't hear you guys for some reason, so as long as you can hear me, great, okay. So this is my presentation. It's called The Misremembering Melba, The Omission of the Experiences of Black Women in Jazz History. Um, and so this is Melba Liston you see on the right, and there's a quote from her on the left. And uh, who is Melba Liston? I guess that's a good place to start. So she was an American jazz trombonist, an arranger and a composer. She was one of the first female trombonists to play in a big band during the 1940s and the 1960s. Um, and as her career progressed, she became known for her partnership with Randy Weston, with whom she created 10 albums. And Randy Weston um, was a famous jazz pianist. Liston collaborated with the likes of Gerard Wilson, Dexter Gordon, Count Basie, Quincy Jones. Um, and she also worked with other people such as Mary Lou Williams, a composer and pianist who was famous in the jazz scene that often does not get her dues, and Billie Holiday. Um, and the experiences of Melba Liston are a lens through which we can examine the systemic erasure of women's accomplishments and contributions to jazz, which is the main point of this presentation and my senior thesis. So background and literature review, some topics that I explored in my senior thesis, not all of them we're going to go over within the 10 minute time slot, but is uh, contemporary black feminism, racism, sexism, the homosocial nature of jazz culture in the mid 20th century and sexual harassment. And a piece of literature that was exceptionally helpful to this presentation and to my essay was Black Women Working Together, Jazz, Gender, and the Politics of Validation by Tammy L. Kernodal. My thesis statement is due to the overwhelming societal expectations, gendered language, and physical threats of sexual assault, harassment, and rape, Black women had to create alternative spheres of affirmation and musical expression because jazz culture prevented their access to musical knowledge um, and the musical knowledge that they needed to create music. And I aim to examine these issues using the experiences of musical, of, of Melba Liston. She's the lens through which we're going to be exploring these issues. So I'm going to focus on this presentation on one aspect, which was bolded, gendered language, um, through the lens of the homosocial nature of the jazz network. So on the right-hand side, we have a picture of Dizzy Gillespie. And this is a quote from Gillespie when he was talking about the nature of jam sessions, um, which was very, well, is very important to jazz culture. This is a place where musicians 
will often workshop ideas before, after, after and at times during their presentations. Um, he described the he described the jam scene as seed beds for jazz musicians, new modern style of music, and he stated that male musicians quote had to be sensitive to each other as brothers in order to express themselves completely, maintain their individuality, and to play as one. So you can see that this is a very, very important part of jazz culture. Um, and he uses the term sensitive to each other as brothers, which insinuates that there's a brotherhood here. So a very masculine quality to these jam sessions. Um, and then we're gonna look at a quote by trumpet player, Clora Bryant, who is another female jazz musician from the mid 20th century. And this is a quote from her when talking about the nature of jam sessions. She says, a woman would rarely venture into a club unaccompanied. Women instrumentalists, no matter how well known, steered clear of the jam sessions. Women who did venture into the performing arena found the range of opportunities limited. So we can already see that there's a juxtaposition in the way that jam culture was experienced. For men, it was seen as essential um, and it was you know, a place where musical ideas were shared, but you see that women didn't have access to these spaces um, for various reasons, sexual harassment being one of those main reasons. So in turn, what women often did is they would have to create their own spheres of affirmation, those own spheres of affirmation being the church or the home or the community, places that they already had access to. Here's another quote that sort of bolsters this claim that women were not seen as equal within the jazz community and they didn't have access to this space. There was a New York Times article from the mid to early 1960s, um, and it's describing when Melba Liston was playing with Quincy Jones's band. The article goes on to talk about how Quincy Jones, quote, occasionally brings her, her being Melba Liston, forward to solo, as she is billed as their composer, arranger, seamstress, and den mother. Furthermore, when she is on stage, when she's on stage, audiences, quote, don't really expect anything from her performance. So there's a lot to unpack here, which we're going to get into. So um, one thing we need to focus on is how audiences didn't, quote, expect anything from her. Um, and how Jones has the ability to occasionally bring her forward. This underscores the gendered power codes um, of the bandstand that reduced female creativity to novelty. And it gave men the power to, orchestra, uh, to orchestrate not just the musical space, but also the physical space of the bandstand as well. Um, we also have to look at the term den mother um, and also look at composer, arranger, seamstress, which also has uh, gendered language, which is associated with women in jazz performance. The term den mother, for instance, is a female maternal figure that's responsible for taking care of and ensuring the well-being of people, usually children, especially children that are not their own, for instance, um, in Boy Scouts or in Girl Scouts. So we already see that instead of the focus being on her as a performer, it's on her being nurturing and being, you know, a caretaker. These are all very gendered labels, which is synonymous, synonymous with the experience of women in the mid 20th century. Um, we also see the order in which they talk about her being a composer, arranger, and seamstress. Um, so, so it's subscribing to a gendered hierarchy because the feminine labor of being a seamstress is considered subordinate to what is an exercise in male creativity, such as being a composer. So composer comes first, but she's an arranger and she's a seamstress, and you have to really pay attention to that order. It's you can't describe Liston as just being a composer or an arranger. She has to be maternal in some way. Um, and one of the other people that I quoted um, throughout the essay is Lisa Barg, and a quote that she says is Liston by subscribing uh, feminine labor a seamstress is subordinate to what is considered an exercise in male creativity composer and allows Liston to be seen but not without the carefully crafted guise of gender norms. So as we see we have a seamstress here we have a den mother here these are some of the first images that come up if you do a google search of what a seamstress is what a den mother is so this is how Liston was described and these are the images that are associated with her description. Um, another way that Liston was really discriminated against, I think a prime example, is when she was performing with Dizzy Gillespie's State Department Band in 1956. And I put that in quotations because that wasn't the official name, but that's what it was called because this band was put together. It was an ensemble and it was the first American jazz group to tour Europe, the Middle East, 
South America as a part of Eisenhower's administration um, strategy to use the mass mediation of American music to combat communism. So this is a very important band that Melba Liston was a part of, not just um, socially, but also culturally, and it had an international impact. So when Liston arrived to New York in the 50s to join this band, um, she recalls, quote, why the hell did Gillespie, this is something that someone on the bandstand said to her, one of her coworkers, why the hell did Gillespie send all the way to California for a bitch trombone player? Reportedly, after she played her arrangements, the men said, mama's all right, now referring to Liston as mama instead of bitch, which might seem like a step up, you know, like, oh, call her mama instead of bitch. However, the term mama itself is nuanced and carries a racially charged history, especially when talking about black women. So um, Kernodle writes this, Tammy Kernodle, <clears throat> someone that I reference a lot throughout my paper. While the term mama is often used to acknowledge the strength, power, and nurturance of black women, in this case, the use of mama is duplicitous. It is an acknowledgement of Liston's strength as a musician, yet it is also reflective of her willingness to take on certain domestic needs of the band. Mama becomes a term that is associated with the domestic role that many um, black women had to take on as they wound up being a service to the men around them. For instance, Liston did more than arranged music for men. She reportedly cut their hair, sewed their buttons, and did laundry while they toured. This was something that men were not expected to do. So even though she was composing for this band, she was arranging for them because some of her male counterparts didn't even know how to read music or arrange music. She's doing all these things. She's still described as a den mother, a seamstress, and she does not get nearly enough credit as she deserves. Um, something else that she experiences, which we don't go into just for the sake of time, she experienced rape and sexual harassment for many years um, while she was touring. And this didn't just happen in Gerard Wilson's band, which she discusses in the 1940s. This also happened in Gillespie's band as well. So we can see that there is a history here of Black women not only having their intellectual property being taken, but also their physical bodies as well being taken for granted in the jazz arena. So in conclusion, to wrap it up, women made invaluable contributions to jazz in the mid 20th century. Um, and they are still making great contributions to jazz today. But unfortunately, women, especially black women in mid 20th century jazz culture are often forgotten due to the overtly masculine culture of jazz. And this is to the, de to the detriment of our collective remembrance of jazz as a whole. Um, jazz hen uh, history has the potential to be far more vibrant, inclusive, and rich, but we must remember and acknowledge women and the societal woes that affected their ability to perform to their greatest potential. Um, and using the lens of Melba Liston. And she's just one of many black women who often don't get her dues in jazz culture. But yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you, that was amazing. I found that really fascinating, really interesting to hear. Thank you. Historical. Just stop screen share and see if I'm able to hear you guys now. Um, left out from our, you know, the, the usual history that we hear that your gender analysis and the, all of that was really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. You got lots of claps, you're getting Zoom claps. Lots more. Does anybody have any questions? And you gotta wave. <laughs> that's my that's my thesis advisor, <laughs> Professor Zach. <laughs> that's good. That's good. She looks happy. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, could you just give us an impression, Victoria, of how uh, Melba Liston's experience would compare to the experience of a female jazz musician today? Yeah, sure. 2020. Um, I think that fortunately, in in light of many movements such as you know the Me Too movement, it's easier for women to talk about issues that they are facing on the bandstand, and I think that some of the very overtly sexual experiences that Melba Liston experienced wouldn't happen as frequently today. However, this does still happen. So shameless plug and side note, I'm working on a podcast that I made while I was in South Africa over the summer. Um, and I spoke with female jazz musicians about their experiences. And there are still women, you know, today who are performing, who experience sexual harassment very frequently, um, who it's still seen as a novelty when they perform. Instead of being like, oh my gosh, this is a great drummer. It's, 
this is a great female drummer. I say this because I'm a drummer and I've been called a great female drummer instead of great drummer many times. Or this is a great female saxophone player. Or, you know, some of the comments that they receive isn't about their playing or their accolades, but rather the dress that they're wearing or, oh, this was so scandalous or this was so low cut, so form fitting, et cetera. So um, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, the general work. but a big advance is you can talk about it as yes. in this presentation, as in your thesis, as in conversations when, you know, in your workplace. Yes, it's talked about more frequently, but it still happens. It still happens. Thank you so much. And we have one quick question from the chat. Do you have any jazz recommendations? Do I have any jazz recommendations? Yes, I highly recommend. They are not a well-known group, unfortunately, but they do have one recording that they made the name of this band is the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. And this was an all female band that actually recorded and performed during the World War II era. And they were a um, integrated female band that started in a little school in Mississippi. So they had black women, white women, Chinese women, Puerto Rican women reportedly in this band. They also had members of the LGBTQ plus community um, performing as well. So I highly recommend their music. Great album. Amazing. You can put their name in the chat for everyone if you'd like to. And yeah. thank you so much. Wonderful work. We have thank two you. more presentations in our morning session today. Our next present presenter is Naomi Codrington. Naomi, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. You guys can hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. There you are. Hi, everyone. My name is Naomi Cargenton, and um, here presenting with me today is before, and our presentation is on the effects of luteolin on heart crystal lymphoma in vitro. Uh, we're working with Professor Videnti and Professor Garaban in the biology department. Um, before, we'll um, let's start the presentation for us. All right. Thank you, Naomi. Um, how are you all doing? My name is Before. Uh, Today, before we begin this uh, presentation, we have to have a understanding of what uh, actually is. Uh, this is a type of cancer that affects uh, your lymphatic system. Uh, our systems are actually part of our lymphatic system. And so, uh, what is cancer? is just the body still all kinds of effects. And it can really be um, the main thing here is that this is actually treated, uh, by, you know, treatments like chemotherapy, radiation, and all that. But the answer is that these Wait, are hold on before. you're breaking up a lot. I'm breaking up, yeah. We can understand what you're saying. Wait, hello, can you hear me better now? Yeah, hello, now we can. Is it better? Yeah, it's better now. Okay. So like I was saying, um, this, uh, you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma is a treatable illness. Uh, it may include therapy, and uh, but then these are very expensive treatments and also uh, they have a lot of risks uh, both of them, not safe. So this whole experiment, uh, the goal of this experiment is to find alternative ways of treating this illness and safer ways as well. So let's dive in. All right. So luteolin is part of a group of compounds that are really uh, found in plants, like, you know, fruits and vegetables. And these group of compounds are first to flowers. And, you know, they have a role in, uh, you know, a big role in treatment in human illness and uh, in cancer. Now, in this study, we studied uh, research in Jolene, Christine, uh, Amara, and Myrcetin. These are the four founders we put us on. And after performing uh, WS, so uh, the essays, uh, it results actually favor luteolin and being put against uh and uh just to give an overview uh we're gonna talk about uh aoetbr 
uh, you know, assays. And uh, AO stands for Accretion Orange, Ethereum Bromide, uh, uh, you know, and ETBR stands for Ethereum Bromide. Now, what Accretion Orange does uh, in this assay is that it's able to pass through the membrane of light and consider your name by Accretion Orange abstains the screen. Uh, with ET, uh, with, with ETR, what it does is it only pass through dead cells, right? And so here we can get a comparison of uh, on image. Uh, let me scroll here so that we can see. So here in the results, you can see an image of uh, green and red uh, dots actually representing cells. The green dots represent live cells and the red dots represent dead cells. We'll get to that later on. So below here are common foods that are rich in, or that, that we can actually find luteolin in. Uh, the highest being thyme uh, of 51 uh, milligrams uh, per 100 grams of food weight, and the lowest being apples uh, with 0.17 milligrams. All apple lovers out there, don't worry. Apples are still very healthy. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So here are the molecular structures of the flavonoids I talked about earlier. Uh, you know, and these are the four flavonoids that we studied. Uh, now, a term that we will be using a lot here is L428 cells. And whenever we say L428 cell, it's just a cell line. It refers to a cell line of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Right. So here, uh, Naomi will take over and explain the uh, procedure and results that we have. Um, yes, hi you guys. Um, just to do a quick view, um, overview of what before I was saying, because I know he was breaking up a lot in between. Um, basically, luciolin is, um, is, what the drug, is a drug that we uh, are using to treat our cancer cells and has found to have anti-cancer properties. And luciolin is found in the fruits to the left, and fruits and vegetables that before I was talking about. And so um, currently treatments for Hodgkin's lymphoma um, are found to have a lot of side effects. And so we're trying to see if luteolin would be like a good substitute of treatment. And we did two experiments. The first one is called WST1, cell, prol cell proliferation assay. And basically w WST1 is a solution that binds to the salt, um, the tetrazoleum. And this is produced by the mitochondria dehydrogenase and it is found only in live cells. So basically, see inside a chart, if you go zoom in more before the first chart, or graph, sorry, the graph at the top. Yeah, that. so that graph shows um, how much cell is alive. And um, when not treating, when not treating the cells with any luciolin, um, you see that there's 100% of cells um, that's alive inside the well. And then when you give the cell 10 micromole of luciolin, it goes down by a little bit. So I think there's about like 90% of cells um, that's still alive. And then if you give um, luciolin 20 micromole, it goes down to um, 70%. And when you give it to 40, it goes to 50% and 80, 30%. So as you guys can see, luciolin is killing these cells. Um, below is a, is a graph that shows um, what looks like underneath the microscope. And basically we use DMSO as the um, control. Um, DMSO doesn't like give the cell extra food and it doesn't kill the cell, it's just like a control. Luciolin is our drug that we'd be using to test to see if it's killing the cells. And so as they might move um, for them, they're still still thriving, they're still cell you know, functioning inside the well. At 10 microns, it's still the same, there's no um, difference. At 20 microns, um, I think for luteolin, it's a slight difference, but it's still, there's no major difference um, between the cells. But at 40 microns, as you guys can see for the picture, luteolin, there's hardly any, there's a little bit of cells left. And for 80 microns, there's like a very few. So from this graph, um, you guys could see that 40 microns is the magic number. It's when it's, you can see like a good difference between um, the cells that's, the, you can tell that luteolin is killing the cells basically. Um, 
inside the other experiment to the right, we did like a live dead assay. And this assay basically tells you how much cells is dead. So um, acrid and orange is it's a dye that passes through live cells and makes them stain green. I don't know why they call it acrid and orange, but it stains them green. <laughs> and ethylene bromine um, can pass through dead cells and stains them red. And so as you guys can see, it has DMSO. Remember, DMSO is the control. There's only a few um, orange dots which represent um, dead cells. And that's only because that they undergo, you know, regular cell cycle. You know, eventually cancer cell dies, you know, regular cell cycle. But for luteolin, there's a whole bunch of orange cells and there's very few green cells. So this just shows you that luteolin is actually killing these cells. Um, the chart below um, also shows that DMO, DS, DMSO, sorry, the control had only 6.6% .6 of dead cells, but luteolin had like about 30% and maybe more in 48 hours. This is showing in 48 hours that luteolin had 29% of dead cells um, inside the well. So yeah, um, yeah. basically luteolin is killing these cells. So here we have a discussion and conclusion. Reminder that you're close to Sorry. time. Thank you. So, uh, you know, these results that we have discussed clearly show that uh, luteolin is very efficient in, you know, inhibiting the proliferation of L428 cells. And, you know, uh, in that comparison, in future studies, we wish to study the mechanisms by which luteolin actually does this and prevents or reduces the cell growth. And uh, actual uh, further studies will also be needed, uh, like in vivo experiments with, say, mice, so that we can actually test the runtime effectiveness in you know, the live tissue and cells structure. And also comparing synthetic drugs that we have uh, you know, in pharmaceutical companies versus luteolin and how effective that is, and comparing which is safer or not. So these are future uh, experiment endeavors that we, uh, we wish to embark on. Here are our references, and we would like to thank uh, Dr. Redenti and uh, Dr. Uh, Gabern, Gabern uh, for their help. The whole uh, Redenti lab team, uh, great people. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. That was wonderful. You're doing such important work, and you are making so many important inroads for people's health. This is super important. Thank you so much for your Thank work. You. I'm finding it very interesting. Thank you. Does anybody have any quick questions for the presenters? Oh, I'm seeing your Zoom claps. They're coming in. <laughs> Great job, guys. More Zoom claps and thumbs up. <laughs> Sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Guys, um, do you use ethidium bromide, um, the, uh, which is extremely carcinogenic? Are you, are you able to use another reagent that is not as carcinogenic as ethidium bromide for your experiments? Um, so um, we perform multiple experiments, but we use ethanol bromide just to, as a, like the dye form, I guess, to like show, um, uh, the color, but it's like it right. passes still only that cell. So I guess like it's not as harmful to like this like because it passes through dead cells. I guess it doesn't affect the live cells, right. and right. so that's why it's able to show up. Is that, that did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. It's just because there are other reagents that they are um, less toxic to deal with in a lab. Um, but I, I just wonder why you pick oh. ethidium bromide, that's all. Okay, so it's because that we want to see like the color contrast. So if we use something else, um, another, another dye, it won't be as strong enough against the green, against the, what we're using. If, yeah. So right. ethanol bromide did a, a better job at showing that, um, showing, like bringing out the color out of the dead cells compared to other dyes. Yeah. Well, so basically, you, know, we can, you can use uh, cyber green um, instead of ethidium bromide, and then to stain the cells, you can use another color. But I wonder, it's just for safety reasons, that's all. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the, for the options that you've given us. Thank you. Thank we will you look, very we will much. look more into that. Yeah. Thank you so much.
All right, guys, great job. Our next presenter and our final morning presenter before we move into our short break and um, keynote speaker is Hilal Maharam. And Hilal, are you ready? Once you're ready, I'm gonna stop the recording right now because I know that your lab prefers that we do not record.